Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm here to talk with Marsha Zug. Am I saying that right? <laughs> please, please tell me if I'm not. I'm happy to say it correctly. Oh, it depends if you talk to my husband's family. Oh. I <laughs> <laughs> would say it's Zug. Oh, okay. So Marsha Zug, we want to make sure that <laughs> husband is happy since, you know, we're going to be talking about marriage today, um, about her book, um, all the reasons why not to get married. No, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> the the non-love reasons to get married. Yes, uh, beyond reasons to get married. So um, we are going to be talking all about that. And I think this is going to be really an interesting conversation. But before we get to Marsha, I just want to say a couple of things. One is you can... Um, we are we're thankful to the friends of the Ashland Public Library and they support all of our programming we couldn't do without them. Marsha let us um, uh, do this program with other libraries. So we have several a bunch of partners of a, a lot of libraries jumped onto this because it's such a fascinating topic. So I'd like to uh, welcome the patrons from all those libraries as well as Marsha's fans and Ashlanders. So um, we're going to be talking for about an hour. Marsha has a presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the Q and A. It's a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can. I'm going to turn the chat off during her presentation just so that there's no distractions, and then I will moderate questions to her at the end of her presentation. You can buy signed books by Marsha from um, Aesop's Fable, our very favorite indie bookstore. And you can also reserve them from your local library. I know we have a copy of it in Ashland, although last I looked, it was out. Somebody had checked it out. So <laughs> you know it's getting out there. Um, so welcome, Marsha. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so glad that you chose to do this. Um, I know you're a professor, you're a writer, you're like a Renaissance woman. Tell us more about yourself and this book that I cannot get the cop the title right with. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm very excited to be here talking about the book. Um, and I'm also always super excited for the questions that may come out at the end. So uh, I'm a law professor. I teach at the University of South Carolina. My specialty is family law. So I write a lot about marriage. I'm fascinated by marriage, uh, but I come at it from a legal point of view. So this is not a romantic book. Mm -hmm. uh, their love comes into it, but that's not really where, um, what I'm examining. So what I thought I would do is I would read two passages from the book that one's from the beginning, one's towards the end to give you a sense of what the book covers. And then um, I'll talk about, you know, bit more in depth, a little bit more after that. So I want to start um, with my dedication. So I dedicated the book to my parents, Chuck and Joan, who married for love, to my daughters, Will and Lucy, who I hope will marry for love, and to my husband, Jordy, who was sure to get grief for this book, which has absolutely happened. Um, Mina was asking me about the title. I had a little, uh, I have a neighbor uh, and his daughter, they ordered the book. She gets the book in the mail and she looks at the title and she's like, oh, poor Mr. Zug, because she thought that the book was about how I settled for him. So that's why I have that disclaimer there because the poor guy is going to get a lot of that. So Y'all Do was inspired by the marriage of my great aunt Rosie, a brave woman who didn't marry for love. In the late 1930s, Rosie was working in a garment factory on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Like most of the workers, Rosie was Jewish. Her best friend in the factory was also Jewish and both understood the dangers posed by the rise of fascism in Europe. Rosie and her friend were safe, but her, friend bro her friend's brother Saul was not. Saul lived in Poland, and as the Nazis rose to power, Saul's family began to fear for his life. They desperately sought to bring him to America, but the U.S.'s draconian immigration restrictions severely limited the immigration of undesirable groups such as Jews. Saul was stuck. America would never grant his immigration application, with one exception, marriage. The only way to get Saul out of Poland and save his life was to marry him. So that's what Rosie did. In late 1937, as Nazi Germany was preparing for war, Rosie left the safety of America to marry a man she had never met and save his life. Saul entered the United States in September 1938. He moved in with Rosie. They had a daughter and fell in love. Rosie and Saul's story has a happy ending, yet it's a tale that haunts me. If Rosie hadn't married Saul, he almost certainly would have died in a Nazi concentration camp. Marriage saved his life, 
but only because a racist U.S. immigration law denied him entry in the first place. The Old Do is full of similar stories, stories that show how generations of American men and women have used marriage as a loophole to circumvent unfair or discriminatory laws. Unfortunately, not all these marriage stories are as admirable as Rosie's. The Old Do reveals how the rights and benefits that attach to marriage can also perpetuate harms. My family has a second darker marriage story that falls into this category. Many years ago, one of my relatives lived with his wife and daughter. The daughter was mentally disabled. It may have been a birth injury. And after her birth, the couple was unable to have more children. This caused them great sorrow. And when their daughter was grown, they paid a man to marry her and provide them with a grandchild. The marriage took place nearly a century ago and the daughter's capacity to consent does not appear to have been an issue. The two were legally married and shortly thereafter, the daughter fell pregnant. Then having fulfilled the terms of the bargain, the husband disappeared. Nine months later, the daughter gave birth to a healthy baby. The second story is about marrying for money, but it's also about marrying for parenthood and for criminal and legal protections. Marriage provide the husband with money while also protecting him from criminal prosecution for rape. There really isn't any other way to describe it. In addition, marriage gave the grandparents their long for second child and protected the child from the legal taint of bastardry. The specifics of my family's stories are unique. However, their instru instrumental use of marriage is not. I have a neighbor who married to lower his university tuition, two friends who married for tax breaks, and a colleague who married for a green card. These four are just the ones who have told me about their non-love reasons for marrying. Presumably, I know many others, and chances are you do as well. Perhaps a non-love reason even motivated your own marriage. So that's from the introduction. And then I want to read you one more, uh, th this advertisement. So in 2007, the following post appeared on an online message board from a woman seeking a rich husband. What am I doing wrong? Okay, I'm tired of beating around the bush. I'm a beautiful, spectacularly beautiful 25 year old girl. I am articulate and classy. I'm not from New York. I'm looking to get married to a guy who makes at least half a million a year. I know how that sounds like a lot, but keep in mind that a million a year is middle class in New York City. So I don't think I'm overreaching at all. Are there guys who make 500,000 or more on this board? Any wives? Could you send me tips? I dated a businessman who makes average around 200, 250, but that's where I seem to hit a roadblock. $250,000 won't get me to Central Park West. I know a woman in my, in my yoga class who is married to an investment banker and lives in Tribeca, and she's not as pretty as I am, nor is she a great genius. So what is she doing right? How do I get to her level? How do you decide marriage versus just girlfriend? I'm looking for marriage only. Please hold your insults. I am putting myself out there in an honest way. Most beautiful women are superficial. At least I'm being upfront about it. I wouldn't be searching for these kinds of guys if I wasn't about to match them in looks, culture, sophistication, and keeping a nice home and hearth. She then receives the following answer. I read your posting with great interest and I have thought meaningfully about your dilemma. I offer the following analysis of your predicament. Firstly, I'm not wasting your time. I qualify as a guy who fits your bill. That is, I make more than 500,000 per year. That said, here's how I see it. Your offer from the perspective of a guy like me is plain and simple, a crappy business deal. Here's why. Cutting through all the BS, what you suggest is a simple trade. You bring your looks to the party and I bring my money. Fine, simple, but here's the rub. Your looks will fade and my money will likely continue into perpetuity. In fact, it is very likely that my income increases, but it is an absolute certainty that you won't be getting any more beautiful. So in economic terms, you are a depreciating asset and I am an earning asset. Not only are you a depreciating asset, your depreciation accelerates. Let me explain. You're 25 now and will likely stay pretty hot for the next five years, but less so each year. Then the fade begins in earnest. By 35, stick a fork in you. So in Wall Street terms, we would call you a trading position, not a buy and hold. Hence the rub, marriage. It doesn't make good business sense to buy you, which is what you're asking, so I'd rather lease. In case you think I'm being cruel, I would say the following. If my money were to go away, so would you. So when your beauty fades, I need an out. It's as simple as that. So a deal that makes sense is dating, not marriage. By the way, you could always find a way to make your own money, and then we wouldn't need to have this difficult conversation. With all that said, I must say you're going about it the right way. Classic pump and dump. Hope this is helpful. And if you want to enter into some sort of lease, let me know. So I chose those two uh, different parts of the book to give you a sense of uh, the different ways the marital bargain can come out. Uh, 
uh, how uh, different, you know, my own personal stories with it, modern stories with it. Um, and the book really runs the gamut. So it is a history of marriage told through these non, non love reasons for marrying. So I wrote this book very much because of the story of my great aunt Rosie. So that's a story that always really stood, uh, just, just I, stayed with me my entire life. And uh, you know, it's always told as Rosie's a great hero and it's a happy story. Um, my niece is named Rosie after her, but it was very close. I mean, the reason she married Saul was because there was no legal way for him to come to America. And I decided to start thinking about these different non-love reasons that people marry. And it has to do with the fact that marriage, for all our discussion of marriage as this romantic, um, love-based institution, it is a legal arrangement. And marriage comes with all sorts of rights and benefits. So I wrote this book to explore these non-love reasons for marriage. The book is structured by theme and stories and not so much chronologically. So there are six chapters. Uh, it's bookended by the two chapters on marrying for money. So it begins with a historic chapter on marrying for money in the past. And then it ends with the modern exploration of these economic arrangements. Uh, I have chapter two is on marrying for government benefits, things like marrying for immigration benefits, uh, marrying for status and power, marrying for criminal benefits. So one of the questions I often get asked is, you know, what are some of the most surprising things that I found in the book? And I think it's the idea that people have married and continue to marry for criminal defense. And that just sounds so counterintuitive, right? To our ideas that marriage is supposed to be about love and commitment and not um, as a way of avoiding criminal law, right? Um, and then the last uh, of the sections is on marrying for parenthood. So I thought I would start today by discussing the marital bargain, which um, I have some slides that Mina's gonna help me with because I am hopeless on technology. So the marital bargain is this idea that marriage is, Marriage is an arrangement and the typical, uh, the typical bargain, the historic bargain, um, if you look on slide two, is the idea of women marrying for money and men marrying for services. So that was your historic marital bargain. Women didn't have a way of making their own money. Um, and sometimes in the past, so this is a picture of what was called a wife sale. And these were not that common but they did occur, it was actually a form of early divorce, but it made very, very clear the idea that wives to an extent were to be purchased. It didn't mean uh, without their consent, but it meant that what men were bringing into the marriage was their economic, Uh, you know, wealth, what th that's what they could provide. So women in, for most of history, uh, didn't really have ways of making their own money. Uh, a slide three will show you, it's a political cartoon about coverture. Coverture was the legal disability that women were under, which meant that women didn't have really their own way of making money. They didn't have a legal identity. And once they got married, they were literally covered by their husband's identity. Uh, so you needed to be very careful when you got married because your husband was going to be in charge of you in lots of ways. So the women needed to marry for economic security and the men would marry for the services that women would provide. And that was considered okay. The early concerns with what we would call gold digging today weren't about women marrying for money. That was fine. The reason it was fine is because once you were married, you couldn't do anything with your husband's money. Under the doctrine of coverture, he controlled all of the money. He controlled the money that you may have brought into the marriage. So gold digging women, not a concern. The concern in the past actually was about gold digging men. 
because under the doctor of coverture, men had access to all of the money that women brought into the relationship. Now, why did women bring money into the relationship? It tended to be inheritance. So early on in the early 19th century, the fear of marrying for money led to things like married women's property acts, the way of keeping money uh, set aside for the women because they were worried about these gold digging men. And there are a whole bunch of laws that as I was writing this book that I uncovered were really about protecting women from gold digging men. So some of uh, the laws that I talk about, things like um, age of consent, right? We have the age of consent laws because we were very concerned that young girls would be much more willing or much more likely to uh, be convinced by these gold digging men who didn't really like them, but could convince them that they would, you know, they were in love with them, and the girls would marry them, and they'd ruin them, you know, take all their money and leave them destitute. Incest laws are also based on this concern. If you're worried about your random gold digging man, well, then maybe what you want to do is keep it in the family. So you pass laws that make it okay to marry the family, right? So chapter one is about the marital bargain, this idea of uh, marrying for money and how that was acceptable, but also uh, laws that were put in place to prevent some of the concerns that came from the marital bargain. Now, one of the other things, and um, go to slide four, that happens with the marital bargain and this very overtly uh, overt idea that marriage is an economic arrangement is that we understood that when marriages didn't work out like they didn't happen that this was economically bad for the women so back in the 19th century and 18th 19th century women could bring these claims for what were called these um heart bomb lawsuits. And they were brought for economic claims like breach of promise to marry, seduction. And the idea was that women were economically harmed when a marriage didn't happen because marriage was an economic arrangement. So these were fairly powerful claims for women. Um, and there wasn't a problem bringing them. One of the other things I talk about in this chapter is how that disappeared with the rise of the love match, the idea of money in marriage, Mar uh, money began to be seen as tainting marriage, right? We wanna keep money and marriage separate. And one thing that happens with that is that women lose the ability to bring these economic claims. Um, so the, you might be wondering, why did the love match happen, right? How did we go from having acceptance of the marital bargain, this recognition that marriage is about money for services, uh, I mentioned coverture. Coverture was a very mixed bag, to say the least. The idea was, right, when a woman gets married, she is entirely her whole, her economic, her political um, existence basically disappears. She is covered by her husband's identity. And this also included, and we'll talk about this when we get to marrying for criminal defense, that husbands had the right to you know, physically chastise their wives. They had the right to um, have sex with their wives with, you know, anytime they wanted, that was part of the merit of those part of the services the women were providing. Uh, this idea of continuing consent, women couldn't say no. So what is your protection against a tyrant husband? The idea was love, right? That the best protection that women had against these potentially brutal husbands was if they married for love. So the rise of the love match was there was a recognition that women were losing some of the benefits they got from looking at marriage as an economic arrangement. But the belief was that this might benefit women more in the end if we make marriage about love. So chapter one also talks about how love replaces the marital bargain, at least in our discussion of marriage. It doesn't change that much legally. So it wasn't that, oh, we're worried about husbands being you know, physically abusive to their wives, so we're going to change that law. Instead, that's still fine. We just suggest that they don't do it because they're supposed to be loving. But if they do, you actually have the courts saying things like, we're just going to draw the shades around this marital scene and not get involved. And that uh, continues to have implications today. So I want to move on. Uh, chapter two 
I talk about marrying for government benefits. And one of the first types of government benefit marriages uh, that occurs are these widow's pensions. So the government's never been big on you know, just giving out money, right? But the one place where they actually felt that it was the government's obligation uh, to support um, its population had to do with veterans and then also the widows of veterans. So it starts out these rules that, okay, the widows of, it starts with Revolutionary War veterans um, and then it becomes very big with the Civil War. And initially it's only if you lost your husband to the war, but that then changes and it becomes anyone who is married to a veteran and he dies is then eligible for a widow's pension. So what this Puck cartoon is uh, making fun of is the fact that all of these women started going around looking for these old veterans, probably weren't gonna last that much longer, marrying them, and then the government would pay them a widow's pension for the rest of their lives. And uh, next slide. One of the, the stories that you may have heard are about these really, really old Confederate or um, Civil War widows who the last, these are some of them, they're, um, they're standing there with their, their older and younger photos, but all of these women married Civil War veterans who were 50, some of them 70 years older than them uh, for the widow's pensions. And this became like, you know, a thing, especially during uh, the Great Depression. It's not that the government doesn't know about it, but the idea behind such benefits is what do we think marriage does, right? Do we think the benefits of marriage um, are so great that the government wants to encourage these types of marriage marriages? And the idea with uh, the, the, the widows of the Civil War veterans was that we wanted someone to take care of them and that we wanted to encourage these marriages and that these were women who were basically fulfilling their, their wifely duties. Even if they were marrying for the money, it was okay. It's not that Congress didn't know this was going on, but they made the conscious decision that the way we were going to distribute benefits, both to first to the needy soldiers was the veterans benefits, but then to needy women, that this was actually preferable to giving money directly to needy women. We wanted to encourage them to marry. So this actually, you'll see this over and over again, uh, most commonly or most um, clearly in social security benefits, right? The way, the best way to get um, government benefits has long been to marry someone who earns money. And then if they die, the government will take care of you rather than providing for needy women on their own. So that's the next slide as well. Um, with regard to the Social Security Act, there was this other one, the one on the right, the Workers Unemployment Insurance Bill, that would have done um, basically Social Security based on need and unemployment, um, whereas we decided to have uh, what we know as Social Security, which for women uh, was they were going to be provided for based on their status as wives rather than workers. And we're still feeling the effects of that. I have statistics in this chapter all about how I think it's going to, I think we're estimating that 25% of women will still be receiving social security as wives rather than workers until uh, I think it was 2095. Right now it's over 50% um, in 2024. So we have a system that was set up this way and it goes back all the way to um, the widow's uh, the widow's benefits and this idea that government benefits are more palatable for women as wives rather than anything else. And this also becomes part of the, the women's rights movement. Uh, the next slide is about that. So marriage and the women's rights movement, uh, the idea that married women shouldn't work. Um, and you, you get that, you know, some from the, the sexist ideas that women shouldn't work, but the idea, you know, these are all women who are uh, holding these signs and it's because they're provided for by their husbands. We have the idea um, very much ingrained uh, both in our law and our culture that uh, marriage is the social safety net for 
for uh, women. That's the, the first line that we um, have in place. So chapter two is on marrying for government benefits. Uh, one of my, I think one of the most interesting chapters is chapter three, which is on marrying for status. And I have the Bridget Jones diary here. Um, because if you, if you remember this movie, she wants nothing more than to be one of the smug marrieds. And what she means by smug marrieds, right, are the, the people who have the status of marriage because marriage in her mind, but she's reflecting the culture is so much better than being single, right? The sad singletons and the smug marrieds. Um, so this chapter is about marrying for uh, status. It's also about marrying for power. And the two were very much intertwined. And I go um, into the different ways this works out. The next slide are the Adamses. And, uh, and you know, those of you who have seen Hamilton too, we know about politically powerful marriages. Um, John Adams, uh, he, 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 there, he has a set of letters with his wife, Abigail, where they're talking about, you know, the constitution and she's his famous letter saying, remember the ladies and remember the ladies letter is about, you know, Hey, maybe give us some rights as well. Um, and he's like, Oh no, no, you don't need rights because you will get your political power through your husband. She's like, well, you know, men sometimes don't listen to us. And he says, no, no, we do. So we're not going to need to do it. Right. He immediately overrules her and by doing so proves that point. So marriage from the beginning was seen as the way that women were going to exert political power. We still have that today as well. Um, some examples of this are things like uh, um, Senate widows. One of the best ways to get elected to the Senate as a woman is to have been married to a senator who dies. And that is still often one of the best ways to uh, get political power. I have in this chapter, I quote um, uh, Justice uh, Coney Barrett, who during her acceptance speech as she becomes Supreme Court Justice, she talks about her qualifications and the majority of the qualifications that she talks about are her role as a wife and mother. So the idea that women's political power is more palatable when it is seen as you know, through their roles as wives and mothers, as opposed to, right, striving women, women who want it just to have it. Um, the, the, what I found interesting about this, um, this chapter in particular was the reactions I often had to it. So some of the statistics that I have in this chapter or not even statistics, some of the laws I talk about are how married people continue to be treated so much better than the non-married. And it's not, it's not in your head, right? It's not just this sense that Bridget Jones had that she was being treated less well as a single person than as a married person. But there are actual studies showing that, for example, single people get worse medical treatment. They have less aggressive cancer treatments because the doctors don't think it's as important to save their lives. This also comes up in who gets the death penalty. You're much more likely to be executed if you are unmarried. The idea that you are just not as, as important. Um, and that's built into the law in lots of ways. All sorts of discrimination, right, has been over the years forbidden. Um, but marital status? That's fine in most cases. You don't wanna rent your house to a single person? You only wanna to rent to married people? Of course, everyone understands that. Married people are preferred um, and the law allows that to happen. So this chapter goes into a lot of that. Uh, one of the uh, other parts of the chapter that I think is so interesting um, is in terms of status, Right. I was talking about with uh, the Bridget Jones, just married people have greater status, but some of that status can also be a racial status. And one thing, particularly as someone who lives in the South, uh, that was shocking to me was how marriage was actually used to change racial categories. So I have, um, it's slide 12, I'll skip, the ha those are the Hamiltons, um, if you know their song about, you know, how he's marrying her because she's a Schuyler sister. But number 12, this is um, 
the uh, a senator from Kentucky, uh, he had chil he was a slave owner and he had children with an enslaved woman. He never freed uh, Julia Chin, who um, was the woman he was having who who bore his children, but he did decide that he wanted his children to be accepted in society. And the the story that I tell about this is he does wind up eventually being able to marry his children, his daughters to white men. And he works very, very hard at this. And there's so much pushback on it, but there's also the recognition that part of the pushback is because by doing so, he can change their racial status and have them accepted in white society. And I have a bunch of stories about this. And again, like I said, as someone who lives in the South, you know, you think you tend to think about the Jim Crow segregation, but in the antebellum era, actually, race was a little more fluid and a lot of it had to do with social acceptance. So if you were accepted as white, you could become white, even if you clearly weren't. There's a story I tell about a family in Virginia who had been enslaved like a few years before the case that winds up uh, that I talk about. So they literally had been enslaved. They had been freed. Uh, many of them married white people. Uh, but the rule in Virginia was that if you were a freed slave, you needed to leave. Um, they didn't allow you to stay there. So I think you had a few years. This family clearly violates that rule. And the question is what's going to happen to them? And their whole community start, you know, writes to the Virginia legislature saying, no, no, you need to let them say they're white. These people were not white. They had been enslaved five years earlier. But part of the proof that was used to show that they were now white is that they were married to white people, which showed their acceptance within the community. So marriage often could be a way of, it could be done as, you know, actually just hiding, right, and passing that way, but also open acceptance. Um, and marriage was a way of increase, increasing your status by changing racial categories as well. Um, okay. Um, I am maybe running out of time a little bit, so I'll talk just a little bit about um, marrying for criminal defense. Um, so that's where I was talking about, you know, discrimination against singles, but uh, criminal defense, <sighs> This was a disturbing uh, chapter to research. So child marriages, right? Why do we allow child marriage in this country? I'm saying this as if I expect an answer from my class, but these, these are, I don't know if I can answer exactly why we allow child marriage, but one of the reason why people enter into child marriage or enter into marriages with children is if you're someone who wants to have sexual relations with children, it makes sense to marry them because then it's legal, right? Uh, the the picture on the left um, is this, this famous child marriage case of Daddy and Peaches. Those were their nicknames for each other. And he, um, he meets her, he's like judging a high school dance. Shocker, right? He liked to hang out around high school kids. Um, he falls for her. They, uh, the, he's very, very rich. And Peaches's mom is actually fine with this. Peaches, I think, is 14 or 15 when she starts dating daddy. He's about 55, 60. Uh, this is in the 1920s. Uh, there are child protective services at the time. And the, the superintendent for child protection actually starts getting worried. So he starts investigating this. He's closing in on them. So what does daddy do? He marries Peaches. And once he's married to her, then it's fine. And their relationship is, is horrible. They don't stay married very long. Um, he basically ruins her life and she dies fairly young. And it's horrific. Um, but one of the things that marriage can do is it can hide or permit otherwise criminal acts. It can transform otherwise criminal acts into non-criminal acts. The, the girl on the right, she was um, entered into a child marriage because her family married her off because they wanted to bring in, um, to avoid immigration laws, right? And children are easier to control than uh, 
than adults. So they forced her into a child marriage so she could bring her husband in and evade immigration laws. Um, this chapter talks about child marriage. There's a lot on domestic violence in it as well. Uh, yes, domestic violence is illegal within a marriage as well. But when you start looking at the laws, it's actually much less punished within a marriage, both as a actual uh, legal difference. So I teach in South Carolina. I teach the differences um, with our laws on, for example, marital rape versus rape. Um, in, in a marriage, there are all these extra hurdles that one needs to jump through in order to bring, to prosecute someone for rape within a marriage, because we're still, we still have this idea that, um, that's one of the services of marriage, but also therefore marriage protects you. And a number of these DV cases, uh, that are outside of marriage, the abusers will marry, um, their victims and then they will prevent them from testifying against them. So uh, this whole chapter talks about how marriage can be used as criminal defense um, and disturbingly uh, still is. Last chapter or the, the last section is chapter five on, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about heat of passion, but that's another one. Marrying for parenthood, I've got Michael Jackson up there. Uh, if you are old enough to remember um, when Michael Jackson married Debbie Rowe, you might remember being like super surprised, right? Like, what's he doing? Who is this woman? Why is he marrying her? Um, it makes perfect sense once you understand that the best way to secure legal rights to your child, and it's very questionable about whether or not he was the genetic father of his child, but it doesn't matter if you're married. So this chapter is all about how marriage, particularly for men, is re a really, really important way of securing rights over their children. Um, and I, I have stories from everything from the first uh, artificial insemination and the laws having to do with who can be artificially inseminated, um, the restrictions on who can use ART, assisted reproductive technologies. A lot of these are still limited to the married. Um, marriage is also, like I said, the best way to secure legal rights to your kids. There is something called the marital presumption. All children born within a marriage are presumed to be the child of that marriage. So we're not going to look at whether or not Michael Jackson is the actual genetic father of these children he's married. He has a right to them. Could he adopt kids? Maybe. Adoption's super hard, especially if you might have a checkered past. Um, all of that you can bypass with marriage. Chapter also talks about remarriages. So I have a lot of cases in there having to do with divorce. And when parents are divorced, often the best way for either parent, but particularly for fathers to gain custody of their kids is if they remarry. Then all of a sudden, it's not the father being compared to the mother. It's the mother being compared to the new stepmother. And this has all sorts of weird gendered implications as well, because a lot of times the new stepmother is, let's say, a stay-at-home mom, divorce mom is working, and the courts will do all of this, like, moralizing about which is better for the kids. So marrying can be a really, um, a really good divorce strategy as well that people absolutely use. And then the last chapter is, again, back to marrying for money, but talking about it in the modern day context. Um, yeah, I have a lot of slides, but we're not going to be able to get to that many of them. But yeah, the the um, the sugar daddy slide. Uh, if you, you know, some of you may have seen these advertisements, right? Um, and then there's the MillionaireMatch.com. The idea of having relationships with people for money um, and marrying people for money is still very much part of our culture. And what does it mean? What do we think about it? What does it mean when we um, don't recognize these types of relationships, right? It doesn't mean that they don't happen, but it means that the law often, certainly outside of marriage, um, won't protect women for the, the services that they often provide in these relationships that the men then get the benefit from. So I kind of rushed through that a bit at the end, but I really want to leave some time for questions. So uh, I will open it up to that. And I'm happy to talk more about any of 
any of the things that I've raised or anything else you might want to discuss about marriage. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. That was really fabulous. Um, wow. That's just a lot of information. And I think we're going to, um, I think we'll have lots of really good questions. Um, before we start with questions from the audience, though, I wanted to ask you about your other book about mail order brides. Does it also have this really um, legal perspective on what was going on there? Yes, um, that one's probably a little more academic -y. Um, I had to write that one for, for my next promotion, whereas now I'm a full tenured professor, so I can write more for the general audience. Mm -hmm. um, but that one certainly helped lead to this one um, because those are also transactional marriages. And, you know, male or brides have such such a negative connotation in our society that they're all they're all these uh horrible exploited uh the men are terrible the women are exploited everyone's abused and that's not that's not what i found uh that can happen but in a lot of cases if a lot of times it could be quite beneficial for the women and really what it comes down to is whether or not the law decides to protect them or not mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that people don't realize is that Miller brides actually have a lot of protections against domestic violence that other women don't have. One thing they get, they get a criminal history of these men that they're marrying. And the idea is, oh, if you're in America, you're dating the guy, you'll know his history. Maybe, mm -hmm. but maybe you don't, right? Um, so because there's this presumption that those relationships are more dangerous, in some ways they actually get more protection. And I think the protection's great, but maybe we should open it up to everybody. <laughs> I agree. Oh my gosh. It's a little bit scary. All the things that you just said. Um, Mary Lynn asks, it's a little bit of a long question. Stephanie Kuntz wrote marriage, a history of the, of the evolution of what she called companionate marriage as a relatively recent thing evolving in the 1700s in Western culture. She noted that marriage was more fiscal, political, and, or other gains throughout almost all of history and even exists today though, through, say, arranged marriages like in India. So how does that fit into the legal prism through which you viewed marriage or wrote about marriage? Well, I mean, I am very familiar with Kuntz's book and, um, you know, she's, she's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, I use her work, but I'm looking at more specific themes and I do talk about the marital bargain, but I'm using it more to talk about, you know, when do people intentionally decide not to marry for love and how this affects things today. So the way the chapters are actually broken up is within each chapter, there's a timeline. So I'll look at historically what it meant to marry for criminal defense and how we're still, you know, seeing the the repercussions and the um the the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. So I tie it more together in a way that she does in hers is marriage a history, right? Mm -hmm. They're telling the history of the United States through marriage. And I'm using the history of marriage to, to still analyze where we are now in our treatment, not only of marriage, but of inequality in gender inequality, class inequality, race inequality. People ask, am I pro or anti-marriage a lot? And I'm not either one. Um, I don't believe there's something special about marriage like inherently. I don't, um, I don't come at marriage from a religious point of view, but there is something special about marriage because we have very much decided to make marriage special. We have decided that marriage is going to be the primary way that we distribute rights and benefits in this country. Mm -hmm. And I support anyone who says then, okay, if that's how I have to get my rights and benefits, I'll go marry for them. I think there's, I have no judgment about that, but that is a problem because not everyone can do that. That leaves all the people who aren't able to get married for various reasons out in the cold. And we've made that as a choice, as a way to incentivize marriage, but I'm not sure that's a, it's a fair choice or one that ultimately is more beneficial than harmful. And it sounds to me like what you were saying earlier is that it really affects women way more than men, that ability to marry and how the benefits that people can be, that women can receive from that, not, not just monetarily, but, uh, you know, like behavior and domestic violence and all of those things. It really has so many impacts 
on um, somebody's ability to be happy, really. Um, so somebody says, I'm so excited to read this book. Did you look into non-US dynamics around marriage at all or how this plays out in different cultures? I didn't really. Um, I talk about uh, Great Britain a bit because we get a lot of our laws from them. And one of the status marriages that I talk about are like the dollar princesses. If you've seen Down Abbey, the, the mom in Down Abbey, she's American. She was a dollar princess. She, you know, go, they go over to England to save the, the castles, basically. But it, it got too unwieldy when I started trying to look at other cultures. Um, so I really just do America um, and our history of this. Now, I'm fascinated by marriage in general, and that's absolutely something I might do later, but uh, it just, it was too hard to do for this book. Yeah, that makes sense. Beverly asks, how did you find your examples and case studies? How did you, I would like to know how you chose them amongst all of your research. Someone wrote in one of the reviews of the book that sometimes it reads like a tabloid. And honestly, those were the kinds of stories that I wanted to tell. Like I teach family law, I read crazy cases. You know, mm -hmm. family law has a lot of crazy cases. And I wanted to tell fun stories. I mean, there's, you know, not all these stories are happy necessarily, but a lot of them are really funny. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I'm an academic. I've had to write lots of dry law review articles for many, many years. I was like, let's try not to do that. I'm still telling, you know, a very legal story here, but I want them to seem like real people. And I, a lot of these stories are shocking mm -hmm. and they should, so they should read like they're shocking. Mm -hmm. And um, every time I would come across stories like that, I would put them aside. And um, I mean, this is what I'm passionate about. So I read these kinds of books all the time. So that just every, this is, this is my book and it's all marked up like this. Every single book in my office looks like this. And I'm just tapping things all the time to look for them. That's so funny. Not really answering it. It's just, you know. <laughs> well, you're academic, you know, you're not, you, uh, you know how to do your research and um, pick the best things that, so like you have students that are, you know, probably all different ages, but mostly kind of young. So you have to find a way to keep their interest. So finding something that is the story, like the story is interesting, just fascinates me because there are so many stories out there and which, how do you pick the ones that are not just only shocking, but will keep our interest. And people um, tell me stuff now. <laughs> like, it's almost like we have sort of that priest penitent relationship. They're like, oh, I did that. I'm like, what do you mean? What did you do? They're like, no, I married a male order bride. Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> my <laughs> colleagues and such. So it's fun that people now tell me all their marriage stories. <laughs> Hmm. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> um, somebody says it's very interesting besides your aunt Rose's marriage story. What made you decide to research and write about these topics? I know you have the history, your teacher, um, and you had the two stories, one about your aunt Rose and one about um, the other one that wasn't super happy. So what made you decide to go on? I think a lot of it was that the especially right now, there is so much, there's so much discussion of marriage, but it seems to be either marriage is great and will solve all of our problems and you should get married and that, you know, that'll solve poverty, that'll solve inequality, you know, everything, get married, or marriage doesn't do anything anymore, right? Why? Marriage is an outdated institution. There's no reason to get married. We can contract for all of it. Um, only old fuddy-duddies get married. And a lot of what I want, and I see this, as you said, I have, I have young students. They're, you know, in their twenties um, and they're deciding basically like, you know, how they see their lives. Is mar does marriage make sense for them? Um, and I think it's really important that people totally understand what marriage does before they decide whether to get married or not get married. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the um, exercises I do in my class is I ask my students, how many federal benefits do you think attach to marriage? Someone raise their hand and they'll be like, a dozen, 25, 50. I'm like, okay, this is taking too long. It's, you know, there are over 1,000 federal benefits alone attached to marriage. That's nothing to do with the state benefits. So wow. the idea that people don't know what marriage does means that people can't actually 
be fully informed when they decide that marriage doesn't matter anymore. And that's what a, a lot of what this, what I'm hoping to do with this book, to make it much clearer uh, what marriage does and do we want marriage to be doing that work? Do we want to use marriage to solve racial, class, gender inequality? Is marriage that beneficial? And if it is, okay. But that's the discussion I think. Mm -hmm. um, this is an interesting question uh, follows along what you were just saying. Would you recommend women contemplating marriage to run a credit check, private investigation on potential husbands? Um, I would say spouses because, it, you know, I think everybody should be checked. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure I want to give advice on that. Mm. Um, the... I do think you should be very wary of prenups. I don't think prenups are necessarily bad, but one of the tricks that often happens in prenups, and this has to do with this idea that you're supposed to marry for love, right? That there's inequality, economic inequality in the relationship. So the higher earning spouse wants the lower earning one to sign this prenup. And that could be fair, but a lot of times these prenups are really, really unfair. Um, they're not really contemplating the idea that I'm going to be doing all of these services for you, taking care of the house, taking care of the kids, giving up my job, that kind of thing. And then if we break up, uh, you're leaving me with like nothing. And the idea of bargaining, the weaker party often feels they can't because that shows that they're marrying for the wrong reason, right? Mm -hmm. If they want to talk about what's fair economically, well, then they're not marrying the person for love. No one ever asks about the person who doesn't usually the guy, the higher earner one, who doesn't want to share his income with his spouse. Maybe, you know, contemplating a marriage that could be 20, 30, 40 years, and what, she gets nothing? Mm. Like, why do we... This love has often harmed women. Um, and that's the thing that I think people need to be aware of. I think prenups are fine, but you need to have a relationship where you can have a full conversation about the economics of the relationship and fully bargain for them and without the other one storming off and being like, well, then you don't love me. Mm -hmm. You don't love me if you gave me a prenup then. Yeah. <laughs> um, Susan has an interesting comment about um, dating sites pushing love, not the economics of marriage, um, which is misleading because and possibly the somewhat of a rationale for the higher divorce rate of 50% or more in the US. But um, the dating apps really seem to focus on not necessarily love, but looks hmm. well that's actually why i kind of like millionairematch.com <laughs> because it's so blatant like i think it's fine to marry for looks if that's what you want mm -hmm. um but looks are valuable too uh i talk about the anna nicole smith case and people judge her all over the place but i mean jay Jay Marshall, I'm messing, I'm messing up his name. Um, you know, he's like 90 years old and a billionaire. And mm -hmm. he he wants exclusive rights to her, basically. And the deal is marriage. And he promises that he's leaving her, you know, certain amounts in his will. And everyone, you know, blames her for being a gold digger. But like, her her looks are valuable. I mean, that's how she made her money. And she was going to give those looks exclusively, exclusively to him. And, you know, judging her and not him seems very unfair. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you have these, these marriages where one person basically trades economics for being with a higher physically attractive status person, that's fine. But what's not fine is judging the person with the, the physical attributes, usually the woman, for... Um, thinking that what she's bringing to a relationship is valueless. Mm -hmm. Very true. And we can talk about that a lot more, but not today. <laughs> um, Noreen says the benefit of marriage in the U.S. are pretty clear, but my family in Australia seems to have many of the same benefits without marriage, at least in the 21st century. Do you think that we might see a similar trajectory in the States? Uh, we absolutely could. That's not what I'm seeing right now. Um, we have had 
this is what I was saying. Like, I don't think there's anything inherent in marriage that makes relationships more stable if you're married inherently. Um, and in lots of other countries, cohabitating relationships can be just as stable as American marriages. But in America, marriage is absolutely the, the highest form of relationship. We have all of these legal benefits that attach to it, but also these status benefits. Mm -hmm. um, if In America, if you don't get married, people usually think you're less committed. And a lot of times the, the statistics actually bear that out, that people don't marry because they are less committed. There's nothing, like I said, inherent in marriage that means that's how you have to commit to each other. Um, but the push now is to continue linking these benefits to marriage, to continue incentivizing people to get married. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment in which we might have changed that was actually the fight for same-sex marriage. Oh. Uh, what same-sex marriage did was it re-entrenched marriage as the, the cornerstone of American society. It was, we need to increase the umbrella of marriage and we're gonna include same-sex couples, but we want them married too. We could have said, you know what? Marriage is an outdated, antiquated institution and all of the arguments that same-sex couples are making about how it's unfair because they're being denied all the benefits that come with marriage. We can open them up to them by no longer linking them to marriage, but that's not what we did. So I don't see marriage changing much anytime soon yeah me neither <laughs> um okay so we, i'm gonna just do we, sort of a lightning round because we just have a few more minutes um did you did you discuss in your book about p marrying for companionship especially older people who are already married and then now widowed yes but particularly marrying for care so one thing that often happens is that people will marry um have someone who will take care of them and that's going back to the marital bargain and the services of marriage and that's fine but where that comes uh where that becomes complicated is when like they renege on their promise so i'm a nurse i give up my career then to take care of my now husband um that was the deal we struck he was going to leave me stuff in his will and he doesn't and then the courts are like but love Marriage is about love and you're supposed to take care of the husband that you love and you're not supposed to charge for it. And then women get nothing. Mm. So I have a lot of stories about when, how companionship and care translates into love. And when you hear the court start talking about love, you know, you've lost. Yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, <laughs> somebody asks, where can we find uh, what the thousand federal benefits are? Where would we find that? And um, the, I think glad has a list of them. So during the same-sex marriage, um, the fight for same-sex marriage, one of the things that GLAD did was they compiled all of these federal benefits to show that there's a big difference between being married and not married. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no list of state ones, I don't think, because every state has different ones. Um, um. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that I think I mentioned this, but a lot of people think they can contract for these. Fine. I'll write down all 1,127 federal benefits but a lot of them are status benefits, which means you don't get to contract for it. For instance, immigration. I can't make a contract with you that I'm gonna bring you over mm -hmm. as my person. I can only bring you over as my spouse and I have to meet the legal definition of spouse. So I don't get to decide that. So there are a lot of benefits that no matter what you do, you cannot get unless you're considered married by the government. Which brings me to my last question before I want to ask what's up next for you. Um, can you speak just briefly about um, uh, common law marriage and domestic partnership? Well, we seem to be moving away from both. Uh, so South Carolina recently got rid of common law marriage and we were one of the last states to have it. I kind of like common law marriage. Um, I know there are all sorts of like administrative problems with it. But the reason that I like common law marriage is it tended to protect women who were in these relationships where they've been with someone for a long time, they provided services, housekeeping, childcare, all of that. And then like the men just wouldn't legally marry them. And then they, a lot of times then they die and the women get nothing. Mm -hmm. And it would, it would protect women in those situations. So, and that's what it was for initially too. Um, so I like that, but it's definitely on its way out. Um, domestic partnerships, that was going to be, the alternative to same-sex same marriage. marriage. And mm -hmm. this goes back kind of to my point about one same-sex, same -sex after a Burgerfell, it's 
we, we got rid of, we really got rid of that idea that there might be other forms of relationships that we recognize. We're kind of back to you're married or you're not married. Mm-hmm. And we don't want anything in between. And we want everyone to be married. <laughs> <laughs> what a world we live in. Uh, well, um, what is up next for you, Marcia? What can, uh, are you, I know you write a lot of articles and I know you publish a lot of articles as well as teach, um, but do you have any other books in the works? Very beginning. And it's probably going to start looking somewhat at divorce. <laughs> <laughs> fascinating I mean to go from the two I think is going to be really interesting well Well, I think oh sorry go ahead I think what I'm really going to look at is the ability not to be able to divorce because there's a big push to get rid of no-fall divorce right now so what happens when you can't get divorced oh my gosh all right well I'll be in line for that one um not because I want to get divorced or (laughs) (laughs) but I'd like to know what my rights are (laughs) Um, thank you so much. This has been incredibly fascinating. Things that we don't think about and that certainly don't um, think of from a legal perspective. So I really appreciate your time, Marcia, tonight and um, educating us on all of this. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Great. Well, have a good night, everybody. I hope you have good marriages or not marriages <laughs> and definitely read Marsha's book because it will help us all. So have a wonderful evening and uh, hope to be in touch again soon. Sounds great. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye everyone.